Hi, I'm André Rochette. In a normal setting, this is where I would have welcomed you along with my colleagues and the managers from this iconic site for an insider's view of the technical facilities. As we all know, this year this is not possible. But at Ecosystem, we like finding innovative solutions to meet your business needs, so please follow me. Hello again. So before we start the visit, I'd like to take a few moments to welcome you and um, to, this, to this virtual and unique visit. We usually don't meet our clients on screens, and we'd rather be with you at the Olympic Park, but it would be unsafe to do so. And thanks to technology, today you will go deep into the Olympic Stadium and the Olympic Park, and hopefully you'll try to understand how we collaborated with the people over there to deliver drastic changes to their systems. It's been weird times for sure since March, and it's important to stay connected. But it's also a unique opportunity to think about our old ways and together create new and more interesting ways to create a more efficient and fun future. So I want to thank you for the time and your interest into Ecosystem today. And without further ado, I'll pass it on to my colleague and your host, JP Drouin. Thank you, André. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are in North America today. Uh, and thank you all for joining us on this virtual guided tour of Montreal Olympic Park uh, project. My name is JP Druin. I'll be your host uh, for today's event. I'm from Ecosystem. So first, let me introduce you to the platform you'll be using today. Um, at the bottom, there is a chat box where you can write your questions. So feel free to write them all along the event and we'll answer them in the Q&A at the end. Um, also, feel free and, or, and don't be shy to turn on your video uh, to make this a truly uh, interactive experience that will allow our panelists to see you. Uh, you can keep your audio mute. And, uh, and of course, don't forget to turn off your cell phone. So I'd like now to introduce you to Mr. Maurice Landry, first VP of uh, the Olympic Park, who uh, who's uh, joining us from the from the Olympic Park itself. Good afternoon, Mr. Landry. How are you? Mr. Landry, how are you? Fine, fine. Thank you. Good. So, Good. so uh, Mr. Landry, uh, Mr. Landry will, will introduce us to the site's, to the site's history and project's uh, projects, origins. Uh, origins. Um, so, Mr. Um, Landry, so, Mr. Landry, for those who are less familiar with the site, can, can you introduce us to the Olympic Park's uh, history uh, and, and context? And, and context uh, in, uh, it's really a landmark really site, a landmark in, site in, in Quebec and Montreal. Montreal. Yes, it will be a pleasure for me. So, let me tell, talk to you about the Olympic Stadium. The, you know, the Olympic Park itself is a a huge uh, installation that has been built in 1970, between 1973 and 76. And it's one of the biggest uh, stadium in Canada with uh, 56,000 seats. Uh, this building uh, is very highly complex, has been built uh, under the architecture of Mr. Roger Taïmer. And it, uh, it took uh, almost three years to build it. Uh, at this time, we didn't have time to finish the, uh, the tower for the Olympics, but after that, we, we finished it in 1987. So it's a huge, it's not only the stadium, it's also a tower, it's also a sports center, so it's a huge equipment, and uh, it's recognized all around the world, so everybody knows about this, uh, this uh, stadium very well, and if you show the, the picture of the Olympic Stadium around the world, it's the most recognized by a lot of people around the world. Very well, and can you introduce us to the, the four main compo components of the site and what kind of events they host in particular? Yeah, we have four big uh, elements in, this, in the Olympic Park. The first one is for sure the stadium itself, with, like I said, the 50, uh, 56,000 seats, uh, that, uh, where we can hold uh, a lot of events, like uh, sports events, uh, uh, concert, exhibition of all kinds, and also uh, uh, any uh, any type of uh, events that uh, we want, we, we can hold it. On the other hand, we have also the uh, Olympic Tower itself. So the tower, as you see, is inclined. It's a very specific tower. That uh, and we have a new tenant in it, 
uh, which is Desjardins, the, the biggest financial institution in Canada that is now in the in the center of the tower for now uh, since uh, 2018. We have also at the very top of the tower uh, an observ observatory for the tourists. So we have a funicular that then goes around uh, and goes up by outside of the, the tower and you can climb it uh, with the, the funicular just to go up there and see, appreciate the view around Montreal. We have also the sports center Inside of it, uh, the, uh, the, just under the tower, we have a, a huge power center with seven pools and uh, a lot of equipment, training centers. Uh, that's a, a huge uh, power center. That's one of the biggest in North America for sure. And we have also outside, uh, in front of the stadium, what we call what we call the Esplanade. And the Esplanade is for out outdoor uh, events like concert or any kind of animation we'd like to do outside with promoters. And can you now uh, take us back before the project and, and give us a sense of all the, the, the needs and goals that you had at the Olympic Park uh, that first uh, made you think that perhaps you, you, uh, you needed a, a project to address them? Address them. Yes, uh, like I said, in, uh, the, the, this equipment has been built in 1976, so, so all the energy systems were old, uh, very old. Most of them were installed in 1976. So we, we were at the end of life of those equipment, so we have to replace it. The problem is that we have to replace the majority of those equipment at the same time because they were all at the end of life. So we have to replace all the equipment and it was a huge project. So we have to decide what we're going to do. Do, we, do we, we want to do it project by project, replace equipment by equipment, or try to do it uh, in, in uh, an integrated project? So that's the main reason we have, why we have to face this project, to do this project, is just because the, the, the equipment was at the end of life. We're at the end of life, so that's why. Right, so a lot of right. uh, assets to renew. And, and can you finally uh, walk us through what drove you to, uh, to choose a, a project delivery method where engineering and construction were integrated together and also asking for, uh, um, for a firm to guarantee some of those results that you cared most about? Yeah, uh, like I said, because we got a lot to do at the same time, so we just decided to, to look at it. We were influenced by uh, an association in Quebec, which is an association responsible for the managers of all the institutional buildings uh, in Quebec. And so they, they just came to us and explained us that we we, we have a good project and hands to, do, to look at it as a, an integrated uh, project. So at that time, we we took the decision to go this way because we, would, we, we were looking to replace those but at the same time to transfer the risk to a supplier and at this on the economy the, the contract was done was written it was good for us to like i said transfer the, transfer the risk and at the same time have some guarantee of the any Right. Um, we may be having some uh, audio issues. Right. I don't know um, if you, uh, we you may be having some as well. Audio. But uh, if it's uh, if it's fixed, can you uh, finally give us a sense of the final results? Uh, what? How do you feel the, the the objectives were met at the end of the project? Uh, now looking back, uh, maybe a couple of years. Okay, maybe a couple of years. Yeah, okay. But uh, this project, like, like I said, until we finished it, and we, uh, the result were, uh, we were expecting it. So, uh, even more. So, we were expecting on the, on the cost of the energy per year, uh, we reduce it to, one, we, we can reduce it by 100 and I think for reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emission which we reduced by 65%, which was a very good result also for us. So we, we, we exactly, uh, we, we, uh, we just, we were expecting 1.2 uh, million reductions, but 1.5 is 
better than we were expecting. And for gas emission also, we, we were looking for 60% and we, at the end, reached out uh, 65 So. Thank you, Mr. Landry. Um, I don't know if uh, everything was cut uh, at home, but uh, otherwise we'll, we'll make sure we come back on those points. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our two main panelists for today's events. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Dominique Desjardins, Mechanical and Energy Manager at the Olympic Park. Welcome, uh, Dominique. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Simon Verville, Technical Solutions Director at Ecosystem. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. Uh, starting with you, Dominic, as the mechanical and energy manager, can you tell us on a day-to-day -day basis what, what your role means at the Olympic Park? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so uh, my role and role of my team at the Olympic Park is, uh, first of all, to maintain uh, all the installation. So uh, we have some uh, mechanic, electrician, uh, and uh, the other part is to operate the, the building uh, while there's some event or uh, on a day-to-day basis. So uh, we operate the building and uh, try to uh, operate it uh, to, to manage uh, the energy all the time. Great, and, uh, and you're involved in all phases of the project, Dominic, I believe uh, starting with a pre-feasibility study, then the request for proposal, and, and following with the, the engineering and construction. Can you uh, give us a few uh, elements of each of those phases? Yeah, sure. Um, the first step of uh, that project was to, uh, to do a small study uh, with our internal team uh, to, to see uh, what were the saving uh, uh, that was possible with a kind of project like this. So uh, after that, we, we did a business case uh, with the, those savings, uh, and the savings were uh, really high. So uh, it was uh, able, uh, we were able to, to have a, a good project. With, to demonstrate with the business money. case, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, good. And then uh, you conducted a request for proposal? Oh uh, yeah, after that uh, it was, uh, we need a partner to, to uh, do a project uh, like this. So we went uh, for, uh, on the market to see if there were uh, some uh, company interested uh, to work with us. And uh, then uh, we received a couple of uh, quotations from uh, different uh, companies. And uh, Ecosystem uh, won the contract uh, because uh, they, uh, they promise and they guarantee us uh, an higher uh, amount of uh, saving for the project. Very good, thank you. And, and of course, you were the main project manager from the park on the, the, the rest of the project implementation. We'll have plenty of, uh, uh, of time during the visit for, uh, for you to walk us through uh, that involvement. And uh, can you now show us, tell us more about the site and it's a relatively vast site. Um, and what did that, uh, how did that impact the project? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, the distance uh, uh, at the Olympic Park uh, are uh, pretty impressive. Uh, you see at the end of the narrow, it's the, the power plant that is there, and we need to supply uh, hot water, chill water to all our uh, of, uh, administrative uh, space at the end of the other arrow. Arrow, and uh, we have uh, also a, a small uh, district network uh, to, to supply other building, uh, also with uh, chilled water and hot water. Good, um, and I think also there's uh, there's some architectural elements that are particular to the to the site, Dominic. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that carries some of the HVAC systems, pipes, uh, ventilation shafts that added to the the complexity of the site for the engineers and construction yeah. teams. I know that uh, every building is uh, is unique and have uh, some uh, particularities, uh, but for us, uh, y what you, you see here uh, on the, the picture is some structural element. Uh, each concrete block are unique; uh, uh, they have all their uh, their own dimension. And uh, well, this structure uh, support the stadium for sure, but uh, it's also uh, a, a pipe shaft and a, a, a duct. Uh, ventilation dock, so it's uh, a kind of place that w we had to, uh, to work uh, in the project. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, now moving uh, on to you, Simon. So you were the lead engineer for the project at Ecosystem. Uh, just to put people in context, Ecosystem, you're a firm who, do, uh, who specializes in, in integrated engineering and construction, and you also like to, to commit to results on, uh, for, your, for, the, for your clients. And uh, the Olympic Park was really a, an ideal setting for you because you also specialize in, in uh, uh, the, the design of 
transformation of complex energy systems. So we heard uh, Mr. Landry tell us about all the goals of the project. There were many of them. Uh, there was economical savings, uh, GHG reduction, and, and renewal of, of assets, of aging assets. So you had to design a holistic project that checked all those boxes. Uh, can you walk us through some of the main measures that, uh, uh, that we'll look at today and, and your thought process? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so as previously mentioned, uh, there was a lot of goal to uh, achieve. And uh, each measure that we will present has its own uh, specific role to play in it. Uh, when we start, when we do a project like that, we like to um, to design uh, to meet the, the client's uh, expectations. To um, so it meets also uh, depending on the, the uh, available subsidies, uh, the energy tariffs, and the uh, technical constraint as well. So, uh, and all of this trying to maximize the net present value of the project. So, uh, as you can see on this screen, uh, we covered pretty much all the site with, uh, with the measures. Uh, first of all, we did a, a huge uh, or a massive uh, steam to hot water conversion. Uh, in fact, it's a complete hot water conversion, so there's no steam anymore in the complex. We also uh, retrofitted uh, all this, uh, the cooling plants, so chillers and cooling towers. Uh, we uh, implemented uh, flue gas heat recovery, lighting retrofit on parking garages and all the stadium, also ventilation, uh, optimization, uh, centralized control, electric boilers, uh, and a lot of other smaller measures. Very good, thank you, Simon. Uh, that looks exciting. So, Dominic, give us a sense of the uh, of the the path you'll take us today, virtually at least, virtually, and um, and uh, and show us from the top view of the site which rooms we'll visit. Yeah, sure. Uh, we did this visit a couple of times, uh, well, uh, on an on-site mode. Uh, so uh, we're going to try today to, to show you uh, the same places uh, we uh, normally see. So uh, first, of all, uh, first of all, we're going to pass by our uh, sports center. We're going to enter uh, by the sports center. And uh, we're going to go to the main field to, to, to see the view of uh, the, the field. It's uh, really impressive. After that, uh, we're gonna go uh, see uh, one of our parking uh, and uh, the, also the main entrance. And after that, uh, we're gonna go in uh, some me mechanical room, uh, some typical uh, mechanical room, and uh, also uh, the mechanical room that is uh, under the pool. So we did a lot of uh, economic measure there. And after that, we're going to take a walk, uh, as I said, to the power plant that is at the end of the site. And uh, we will finish there uh, with uh, the measure uh, we did uh, with the boiler and the, the chiller plant. Thank you, Dominic. So uh, let's start the tour now. Uh, you'll see we took uh, 3D pictures uh, with a new software technology to make your experience seem as real as possible. So we hope you enjoy the, the, the visit. And uh, please make sure to say, keep a safe uh, distance of two meters with your nearest uh, uh, person. So Dominic, where are you taking us first? Uh, the sports complex, I believe? Yeah, yeah. so uh, welcome everyone. We're going to enter the, the sports center. Uh, we did not uh, make a lot of uh, works uh, with the, the, the project, with the ecosystem in the sports center. But uh, uh, there was a lot of project, uh, more traditional, uh, in 2013 to 2015. Uh, so uh, we, we uh, retrofit all the, the pool system, and uh, we are uh, really proud of it. So I uh, hope you enjoy the view. Um, we also uh, make a new uh, gym center a training center that you can see uh, by the window uh, up there. So uh, if, you, uh, if you pass by Montreal, uh, I invite you to, uh, to train yourself here. The, the view is really nice if you uh, do your jogging, you can see the pool, it's uh, really beautiful. Uh, after that, there was another big project uh, in that area uh, that we did uh, in the same year. It was uh, the National Sport Institute uh, that you can see uh, to your left there. So it's where the all high-level athletes uh, are training themselves. So uh, 
uh, there's a box and there's a judo also a couple of uh, Canadian teams that are there that are training themselves in the same site uh, with the, the public so it's uh, really interesting and uh, there's a lot of interaction uh, between everyone uh, as you see uh, also uh, the uh, this new building uh, the national institute is uh, have a, a particularity there is no external wall it's a building that have been built in in the building so uh, there is a constant uh, load of uh, cooling because uh, it's uh, in the pool area so uh, so a lot of uh, systems, a lot of energy consumption, I'm sure, uh, Dominic, uh, which we'll look at uh, in, in some of the following measures. So now you'll, uh, usually when we do this live, you take a shortcut to take us to the, the main playing field. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't know uh, if you see it uh, behind me, uh, but yeah, we're, uh, we're going to go to uh, to the main field. Um, we'll and that's a big soon. stadium, right? Uh, how, many, uh, how many people in that stadium? Uh, there is a place for uh, 65,000 uh, 65, uh, people there. It's fully covered. So a lot of specific heating and cooling needs, uh, ventilation and, and the size maybe also is interesting. Yeah, the, the size is pretty impressive. Uh, what you see uh, behind the, all the lights there, it's a mechanical room that go all around the stadium and there's a lot of uh, HVAC system uh, there. So uh, it's a big uh, mechanical room, uh, about uh, 60 feet uh, wide and uh, at uh, two, uh, 200 feet uh, up from the from the field and uh, give us a sense of the the amount of ventilation that's needed to to supply in heating and cooling such an enclosed such a large indoor space uh, I don't remember exactly it's about uh, two million uh, uh, four hundred thousand uh, CFM uh, that are there to uh, ventilate uh, the public right and uh, and so what kind of events uh, happen in this, uh, in this playing field? Uh, there's a wide variety, uh, I assume? Yeah, there's a many type of events. Uh, we can go uh, one day, it's, uh, it, it can be a, a small trade show on the main field. Uh, another day, uh, we have some uh, uh, huge sport events like baseball or football game or uh, soccer also. Another day, it's, uh, it could, can be a, a sport competition like a gymnastic, and some other day, with that, as we saw in the picture, it's a monster truck or a, a motorized sport event. So a lot of variety of events and a, a lot of uh, adjustment also uh, in the, the operation from an event to another. It's uh, always, always different. And some baseball games uh, as well, even though there's no uh, no no uh, uh, pro league baseball uh, team in Montreal anymore. They, there's regular uh, exhibition games. Yeah, uh, we received two two games. Uh, normally, it, uh, the Blue Jays of Toronto that are coming for two games. Uh, last spring, it was supposed to be the Yankees, and we miss it. Uh, but. Uh, what happened a couple of years ago, in uh, June uh, 2015, uh, we had a, a huge problem with one of our uh, main chiller, and uh, it was impossible to uh, to repair uh, those chiller. Uh, and uh, we were we didn't uh, have a con uh, sign a contract with uh, ecosystem yet. So uh, what we did is to uh, to include a schedule. Uh, in the contract, a uh, really tight schedule, and uh, and uh, if ecosystem won the job, uh, they had to do it uh, without uh, any extra cost. Uh, that was kind of a bargain. And uh, the, the baseball was uh, at the the first of April, uh, so and we signed the contract for at the maybe the fourth of uh, January. So they they had uh, three months to do the the job. Yeah, so let's, uh, Simon, uh, you want to cover uh, what happened there before we dive into the measures? It was re yeah. right before the project was to be signed. You already had a, a preliminary construction schedule uh, developed, and, um, and now you, you were faced with a, a challenge to, um, that you had to, to do the replacement of the, the chiller plant, the, the, the chillers and the cooling towers, a lot faster than expected. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell us quickly what, uh, how you managed that situation? 
Yes, yeah, so probably the easiest way of dealing with that would have been to uh, just rent temporary chillers and, you know, keep the schedule as is and do the job the next winter as it was supposed to happen. But uh, obviously we didn't want to do that because it would have affected badly the, uh, the, the cost of the project. So we decided to reshuffle the whole schedule and take that as a challenge. So, uh, uh, and that's a challenge because we had to replace over 5,000 tons of chillers and cooling towers in a three month window. So, uh, but we knew we, we, we would be able to do that because uh, since we control both design and construction, we were able to use our agility to uh, stretch up the schedule. Like, uh, for instance, uh, we are able to do design and construction simultaneously. Like, we start the design, and once there's a, a little part of done, a little part of it that is done, we start construction while we are doing uh, another part of the design, and we go on and on like that, so we can stretch the schedule. Because normally, uh, when we do a more traditional project, let's say uh, we have to, you, you know, you have the engineer, uh, the consultant engineer, who do all the, cons the the design and the plans and drawings. Then you go in a call for tender, you receive the bids, and then you choose your contractor and go in construction. So all of this process takes time, but it, it's possible to to um, compress to compress that if you if you have both control on design and construction. And uh, most of it, uh, we knew from the beginning that we wouldn't be able to uh, do all the controls and commissioning on time. So we just committed uh, to deliver that and operate the, uh, the chillers in manual during the event. So that's what we did. We helped the operators and the staff over there to operate it. And uh, it went pretty well at the end. Uh, we have a great event and uh, uh, we, we hit the home run, like we, uh, we, we like to say. All right. Well done. So let's move now to the parking lot where there was a main uh, lighting retrofit. Uh, Dominic, I think it's a, it's a fairly large parking lot uh, space, one of the largest in, in North America, perhaps, right? In North, America, in North America, I don't know, but in Canada, for sure, uh, we have uh, 4,000 uh, spaces. So uh, we're not going to wall through all of it uh, today. Uh, it's more to show you uh, what we did uh, with the light measure. So uh, before the project, uh, there, there was some uh, sodium light and uh, also metal arc uh, lights. So we replaced all of it with a uh, LED uh, tube. So okay, and, and Simon, can you expand on the solutions that you provided for that space? Yeah, first of all, we used the exact same fixtures or bulbs and ballast that we used inside the, the Olympic Stadium. So we reduced the amount of inventory. So it simplified the maintenance. So it was something that we, uh, we, we, uh, we did to uh, simplify the maintenance. And uh, as well, um, we installed over 44,000 bulbs overall, uh, parking garages and stadium including. So uh, that, was, uh, that was a lot of job. And that had a big impact on your maintenance and, and, uh, and your operation, your maintenance team, Dominic, uh, that lighting retrofit, not having to replace all those uh, uh, failed uh, ballast and tubes after it? Yeah, sure. Uh, there was uh, two electricians uh, required uh, to, to replace tube and ballast uh, every day. So uh, now uh, we are really happy to, to have those electricians doing uh, something else. As the, the new tube uh, will last for at least uh, seven years, so uh, yep. people can do uh, other things. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. So let's make our way to the main entrance of the, the, the Olympic Stadium. Uh, in that space, uh, Simon, so that shows that in this project you did more than just energy savings. You also focused on some of the important business outcomes um, to the park. Um, so tell us what you, had, what you had to consider in the lighting for the lighting redesign of that space. Yeah, so I remember the first time we went there. That's the uh, entrance of the Olympic Stadium. Uh, we went there and uh, I, we just realized that we couldn't do just one, one for one replacement. It just didn't make sense because it was the main entrance. It was really dark. The lighting uh, was unevenly uh, dis uh, displaced. There, there was dark spot uh, because of yeah, the, like light, you, right? uh, the skylight and stuff like that. So we just wanted to, do, to add more value to the measure. We, we wanted to enhance the client experience. 
So uh, we, we sat down with the engineering and marketing department to find a solution. And uh, we, we came up with a design that mirrors the uh, Olympic logo, which are uh, concentric circles. So we, uh, we installed uh, fixtures all around the skylight. So we were able to uh, reduce the energy consumption while adding uh, more lights and increasing the, 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 the lumens over there. We uh, also added a uh, tinted film on the skylight to reduce the natural light which may sound counterintuitive, but after, uh, uh, it, it helped reducing the contrast and uh, the light was more uh, evenly distributed in the, in the place. So uh, after all, uh, we did a great measure and uh, it, it, it shows that it is possible to make savings while you can do something nice and enjoyable. Great, so it's now time to introduce one of the main measures of the project, uh, the steam to hot water conversion. Uh, so that's a measure that was really central to the project and the fact that uh, a lot of the other measures interact with, with it, uh, as you'll see later. Um, so the steam to hot water conversion was, uh, uh, it can be very, uh, it can bring a lot of benefits, but it can also be very expensive. So we'll try to give you uh, some insight into the strategies that were uh, implemented to, to, do, uh, to control the costs, um, among others. So Dominic, uh, let's make our way to uh, the mechanical spaces. We're going to uh, the Western mechanical room first. There was a lot of steam for the project there, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, um, we call it the Western uh, Mechanical Room, but uh, the old uh, worker uh, still call that room uh, the uh, heat exchanger room. Um, <laughs> but as you will see, there, there's uh, no more uh, exchanger. Um, they were a uh, pretty old uh, exchanger uh, and uh, these equipment need to be replaced uh, in the project. I think um, now we see actually a, an empty space that used to, uh, uh, where there used to be a heat exchanger perhaps? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, the, the exchanger, uh, uh, the process was uh, just to let you uh, on, to, to, to let you understand. Uh, uh, the steam was produced at the the, the, the power plant at the uh, at the boiler and was distributed uh, to secondary uh, network uh, that uh, that are a water system. So, yep. So a lot of heat exchangers from steam to hot water occurred in, in that specific mechanical room. Um, so a lot of uh, steam and, and thermal losses, I assume, uh, Dominic? Yeah, that, there was the, uh, many the steam, uh, steam loss for sure. Uh, and many uh, maintenance also. We had uh, about uh, 300 uh, steam traps that uh, were, uh, well, you know, steam traps sometimes leaking if they are not uh, well uh, maintained. And uh, the exchanger, as I said, uh, were uh, leaking also. Uh, so uh, we had about 20% uh, uh, of uh, makeup on our uh, water uh, to the boiler. So it's a really huge number. Uh, so, uh, yep. Thank you. So I think that sets the stage. Uh, so Simon, let's dive into the solutions that you're, you and your team found, uh, especially to control the costs. Of course, the steam to hot water conversion measure was, uh, was the largest in the project in terms of uh, scope, uh, cost, and, and, um, and benefits, and, and complexity as well. So, so give us some insight into how you, uh, you handled this one. Yeah, steam to hot water can rapidly become really expensive if you're not trying to reuse some existing assets and obviously, reusing existing asset may, may become really uh, tricky because, you know, uh, as we are in old buildings, most of the uh, technical information has been lost over the years. So you don't have the, the technical sheets, you don't have uh, the uh, set points, or you don't find the capacity. So you need a lot of expertise and experience when you want to deal with uh, existing assets, but it's the, it's the key element if you want to save money, because if you replace everything in a place like the Olympic Stadium, it, you won't have any payback on the measure. So what we did is uh, we uh, reused uh, pretty much all the steam pipings for hot water supply purpose, but we had to replace the condensate because like most of the time, it, it's whether too small or in too bad conditions. So for this, the, these ones, we had to replace them all, uh, pretty much them all uh, with new uh, hot water pipe. And what kind of tests did you do on those steam pipes that you reused? 
Uh, mostly thickness uh, of the pipe, just to make sure uh, they would last uh, long enough for uh, at least at least 20 years or maybe more uh, if if they, they maintain the hot water network well. Right. So you reuse a lot of steam pipes, replace the condensate, and uh, I think you also uh, uh, did something with the chill water pipes. Yeah, exactly. So uh, just reusing the steam pipe wasn't enough. We needed more capacity and we didn't want to install like huge pipes. So there's a part of the cooling network that is not used during the winter that we reuse for low water temp uh, network. So what we, did is, uh, what we did is installed a uh, couple of, uh, I would say, probably 20 to 25 valves to do a turndown between the summer uh, mode and the winter mode, so the cooling and eating uh, mode. So we are able to use the cooling network for low temperature that comes from uh, the, um, the heat recovery ne network or the, the heat pump, in fact. Great, thank you, Simon. So uh, let's make our way to another mechanical room underneath the the pools, the Olympic pools, I believe, where um, where there's uh, now heat pumps, and and it's in, it's actually quite um, convenient that we're doing this virtually because we couldn't fit all of us in, inside this small room. So uh, so that'll be interesting. And um, so the heat pump measure, I'm sure a lot of people want to hear more about it, Simon, because it's a topic that gets a lot of attention, uh, the electrification of heating and uh, the impact it can have on decarbonization. Uh, a reminder that the project was planned to cut two thirds of the greenhouse gas emissions of the entire site and the heat pumps were key to that to, to reaching that target. So tell us some of those challenges, Simon, that you face at the Olympic Park, and that may be representative of your global experience with the technology in, in general. Yeah, heat recovery is always a, a key measure in a project because obviously it, it's always one of the measures that add the more uh, savings, but also it, it's always challenging because there's always complex design around it and uh, sometimes a uh, new product that, that are let's say, uh, harder to operate or at least to, uh, to manage because there's a lot of interaction between all the systems. So, and at the Olympic Stadium, we went a little bit further because we designed the capacity of the heat pump so they can take uh, the overall heating load during summer and, the, and all the, the cooling load during winter in order to be able to sh totally, sh completely shut down the boilers, the gas boilers during summer and the uh, chiller at the chiller plant during winter. So we, we, uh, we ended up having a lot of uh, operating savings uh, because we, we were able to reduce the surveillance of the stationary engine in the, uh, in the boiler plant and chiller plant. Interesting, give us a sense, Simon, of the, the steam load in summer before the project and, and the heating load that the, the heat pumps carry alone now. Yeah, before the project, we had around 10 million BTU uh, per hour, so around uh, 10,000 uh, pounds per hour of steam in working summer. In, in summer. Yeah. In summer, uh, and uh, after the project, uh, we we now use around 3,000 uh, 3,000 BTU per hours, so uh, 3 million uh, 3 million BTU per hour. So there's around 7 million BTU per hour that was just eat loss. Heat losses through the, the steam system, just through keeping the steam it, uh, system, uh, the uh, the aerators and other components. Wow, and we did a little calculation. Uh, as a matter of fact, Simon, can you yeah. tell us, um, taking into account that that conversion of steam to hot water and the the efficiencies of the boilers before and the heat pump after, what's the the difference in in pure energy input to the system before and after in summer? Yeah, if before we had like a hundred <coughs> units of gas, let's say, uh, input in the boilers. Now we only have five units of uh, electricity in the heat pump. So it's, uh, it's pretty much 20 times better than it was before. Well, thank you, uh, <coughs> Simon. So, of course, all that design talk is nice, but what we wanted to, to see and what your team wanted to see, Simon uh, and, and Dominic, was real results, real savings um, on the energy bills. So uh, one year, Dominic, you started receiving invoices from the gas utility company with the zeros on it for consumption and amount due for four straight summer months. So Dominic, is that right? That was a big and happy moment for you, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. It was a really uh, an accomplishment for us. Uh, and uh, I still have uh, one of these bills, uh, uh, hook up and frame uh, in my office. 
Uh, but the, the oh, yeah, you had it framed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, near my uh, diploma. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, my rep called me one day because uh, they were sure uh, that the or gas meter uh, was broken. Uh, that was explaining that uh, the zero consumption uh, consumption in summer. Right, and, and Dominic, of course, a, a steam to hot water conversion like that it must be uh, somewhat risky, or at least you must uh, want to make sure that it doesn't impact negatively your clients. And, uh, and what is, how important is it for you, the, or was it that there was no, um, uh, no impact on, uh, on service interruptions? Uh, well, uh, we used to do a lot of events uh, in, uh, in the Olympic Stadium, and uh, that, that's our priority, that's our core business. And uh, we used to include in any of our contract uh, some clauses that uh, we, we uh, we had to uh, to keep uh, doing our job and uh, keep having some event. So uh, in all the project, uh, uh, we were open. Uh, and we we uh, kept the control on our operation by working together. Uh, but uh, there, there was no shutdown on the pool or the shower or, or everywhere in the the stadium. So Simon, how did you uh, manage to do that? Because from a a perspective of minimizing uh, shutdowns, uh, one may think that it, it would have been easier to simply install a brand new hot water system in parallel, um, connect it to the uh, heat exchangers and air handling units, uh, turn off the steam, turn on the hot water, and be done with it. But of course, that was not possible for you because it, that would have made the project cost explode. So how did you manage uh, to minimize uh, shutdowns and interruptions with uh, the approach that you took of reusing some of the uh, existing assets that were in good condition? Uh, at most of the places, what we did is just stretch the schedule so we can do all the work during summer, so we won't impact all the eating. But in the, the sports center, since we need heating all year long for showers, for the pool and stuff like that, in that specific place, we installed some piping in parallel and equipment, so we did as much as possible before. And so we, 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 only, had, we only needed just one day of shutdown to do the, the, the conversion from uh, the switch from uh, steam to hot water. And uh, what we did to make sure that they wouldn't see anything, the clients in the, in the pool and, and everybody, we just, uh, prior to the shutdown, maybe two days before, we just raised the temperature of the pool for two or three degrees, and uh, we were able to do our shutdown uh, pretty much seamless. Like nobody noticed that there was any uh, work underneath them, and they, they can uh, they could keep the uh, the sports center open uh, as usual. So uh, it was pretty nice. Great, great. That's good to hear. Uh, there's a slide that maybe we can go back. Go back. We have time now, uh, yep. Dominic. We, it shows the evolution of gas consumption over the the years. Yeah, during sure. the project. Uh, as you see, uh, our gas consumption is really uh, getting down, um, and uh, we're we're trying to to make that line go lower, lower. Uh, Again, uh, and uh, you can see also, uh, you, you saw it on bills uh, that, that there's no consumption in the summer. But you, you, you can see before the project uh, that even in the, in the summer, there was a, about a consumption of uh, 100,000 to 200,000 uh, gas, uh, meter of gas. And uh, now every summer you see that there is uh, nothing and the border are uh, totally off. And the first peak is before the project, is that correct, Dominic? And, and the three following peaks are during the project and we see a, a gradual uh, slope downwards. Did that, uh, where did that, does that come from? Yeah, in fact, wh what's interesting about it is, uh, you know, when you, you enter pro uh, go in a project like this, uh, the, the, the direction of the, the stadium ask us to uh, to be uh, in an efficiency uh, mode so only by talking about the project uh, and having the, the engineer of the uh, ecosystem just uh, walking around everyone uh, began to think about energy so or operator or uh, stationary engineer try to, to to find some solution to uh, to reduce our uh, energy. Thank you, Dominic. So moving, to, uh, moving on to another, uh, another measure, 
or actually an event that happened uh, in, in buildings like, like yours, Dominic, uh, and campuses. Uh, it's a given usually that many projects happen at the same time. Uh, what's not a given always, however, is that project teams um, are necessarily able to be agile enough and adapt quickly to the, what's happening in other projects around them and respect the original budgets and schedules. Um, so Simon, can you tell us about another project that was launched uh, during your project and, and you already had done some of uh, your design were into construction and you had to go back and, and, and adapt your design to, to allow for uh, the, this new uh, external project to, uh, to be compatible with. Yes, so uh, right in the middle of the design, they just told us that they found a new tenant or I should say the first tenant because the, the, in the tower, because the tower has always been occupied since its, its construction. So it was just empty space. And they were about to create uh, office spaces for around uh, 1,500 people. So quite a big project. In the tower uh, behind you, right? Yeah, uh, the tower behind me. So it was like, uh, I think, over a $50 million project. They renovated the tower and make new offices over there and uh, even though it wasn't part of our project, it was out of our scope obviously, but we, we needed to adapt to it because we, um, we were the one who would supply heating and cooling to them. So we needed to readjust our design. Hopefully for us, uh, the, most of the equipment were big enough to, to be able to supply, but we, we, we needed to do some changes in order to adapt to this new design and make sure that we, we uh, we, we could meet their needs. So uh, again, that's something we did without any extra cost or without delaying the schedule. Thank you, Simon. So Dominic, let's move to another measure that's really important, the, the controls measure. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about the, your control systems that you had at the park before the project? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, most of the control or half of the control, uh, I would say, uh, were uh, original. So that was an old pneumatic control system with uh, many leaks and uh, uh, hard to adjust. Uh, otherwise, the other part was a, a first generation of uh, DDC control, as you see on the, the panel. So uh, uh, they were really old also and need to be replaced. Uh, we had to keep, for example, uh, an old uh, PC on uh, Windows XP to, uh, to uh, try to uh, program the, these controls. So. so a large retrofit of uh, a mix of existing thematic and, and older DDC controls. That was the task for, for you, Simon. And, and uh, tell us about the solutions. But more importantly, uh, there was one element um, uh, in this case, that, that made, made a big difference. It was collaboration of your team with Dominic's team. Uh, even though it was part of a turnkey project where, where your, your firm, Simon, was responsible to deliver results, um, how did you make sure that collaboration helped to, to reach those results in, yeah, in this case? We did a lot of collaboration all along the project at some level, but on this particular measure, we really went at another level of collaboration. Uh, we, we, we did it all by ourselves, like the ecosystem and the, uh, the staff, uh, Dominic staff. So we didn't outsource anything. So uh, the staff uh, from, uh, from the, uh, the Olympic Stadium, uh, because they, they were well staff of technicians and, and stuff like that, we can see panels that were built uh, at the Olympic Stadium by their staff. So they were mostly in charge of, uh, of, um, of, doing, of making these panels and installing it, so doing the wiring and stuff like that. And in our side, we were more in control of the sequences, uh, graphics, uh, programming, but they also uh, did it with us. So uh, it, it obviously it helped a lot, this collaboration, but it also helped uh, for, um, uh, for uh, training as well, because uh, since they worked a lot on this uh, on this project and uh, they, they from the beginning when it came to the training uh, we didn't have much to do because they knew pretty much everything about the control sequences and uh, everything related to uh, how it's supposed to work so it was easier to do uh, to do that and they they were uh, I, I was even really surprised that sometimes they were just calling me to give me like some inputs or some uh, some some hints about how we could improve one system, so they really collaborated and they really want, they, they really felt involved in the project as well. 
And Dominic, was that, uh, was that your perception as well, uh, especially with the commissioning? Was that easier, that, that close collaboration on that measure? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, everyone knows that uh, the, the commissioning is, uh, is uh, sometimes uh, a hard part uh, of the project. In that case, since my team, uh, well, did the job uh, uh, as a part of the ecosystem team or uh, vice versa, um, so uh, the commissioning was really easy. Uh, I, I didn't receive any complaint like, uh, oh, that, uh, that uh, warrior is not connected well. Uh, it was uh, just if one of my team uh, saw something, uh, they would just uh, raise up and uh, go, uh, go uh, fix the job. So uh, I didn't really receive any complaint uh, doing the, the commission part. So let's make our way back to the, or towards the, the central heating plant. Uh, there's a fairly long tunnel uh, that, uh, that we usually stretch our legs. Um, so feel free to stand up if you, if you have to. Um, so we're going to make our way there. Simon, does that uh, bring back memories? Did you walk that tunnel a few yeah, times? Yeah, we walked there a few times, uh, <laughs> at, mostly at the beginning of the projects before we, uh, we bought uh, golf carts. Uh, because it was pretty inefficient to walk there several times a day. It's uh, over uh, 800 feet, so... Uh. <laughs> and is there, a, is there a... I think there's a one pipe that, uh, that you, Dominic, and Simon had a long discussion about whether it should be replaced or not between the, the main uh, plant and the, the heat exchangers. What, yeah, we can uh, see it on our end. right side. It's an uh, eight-inch pipe that does all the uh, the tunnels. And uh, I remember having some arguments with Dominic uh, whether if we should change it or not. Obviously, I was on the side of not changing it. He <laughs> wanted to change it uh, because the, we, we didn't know if it was too small or not. Uh, at the end, uh, the client was right. Uh, the <laughs> when we uh, we did the startup, uh, the, 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 the pipe uh, was not too small, but because of the roughness, it was the actually the only condensate piping that we were trying to reuse, okay. and the pipe roughness was too too important. So we had too much pressure drop, so uh, not enough flow rate. So uh, what we did is we 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 decided to replace it. You adjusted quickly and replaced it. Yeah, from the day we decided to replace it, from the day it was in, finished to install, it was less than ten days. So it took less time to install it than the time we argued on it. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's funny. So um, let's go to the chiller plant. Uh, Dominic, walk us through the your main chiller plant and and the, the equipment that you had in there before the project. And I think you you um, you were you were really looking into uh, redesigning and, and resizing the the chiller plant properly, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, we have to remember first uh, that, that the, the, the stadium was built for a, a two-week event uh, that was uh, the, the Olympic. So all the equipment were sized uh, to, uh, to go through that, uh, that event and uh, not for the day-to-day -day use. So uh, before, when uh, I arrived to the stadium, before the project, um the, the the people there uh, just uh, uh start up a, a 2500 chiller at the beginning of june let it roll 24 hours a, a day uh till uh, september and uh and worse than this uh, i saw two of these chiller uh, uh rolling cuz uh, in a baseball mode or uh, in uh, some even mode right. they, they they were using two of them all summer long, so we really need to, to rethink uh, that uh, chill plant. Right. So you were not looking for an in-kind replacement here. Uh, so Simon, can you, there are a few things you want to add here in terms of uh, uh, the, the design that you proposed uh, and worked with Dominic? Uh, yeah, so it was clear from the beginning that it wasn't just a replacement one for one. We, we needed to rethink the whole thing, not just to be flexible for all the event, but also to increase the efficiency make savings and also reduce the, uh, the operational cost uh, because we wanted to reduce maintenance. So we had to really carefully select the number and capacity of each chiller to make sure we can meet all of these requirements. Yep, so um, let's talk about uh, one element of the, the, the chillers that's, uh, that's interesting. Uh, there, there's one of them that's um, uh, that that uh, was particularly sized and 
and located to, to grant some operational savings. And that was really central to, to the way the contract was framed. If, uh, if you missed on delivering those operational savings, there was a big penalty uh, for, uh, for, for your firm, Simon. So can you tell us about that, that, that design and that, that part of the project? Yeah, actually, there was a $2 million penalty if we didn't uh, succeed to uh, reduce the surveillance of a stationary engine from 24 hour a day to one hour a day. So it was, it was quite a lot because we needed to stay at approximately the same capacity of chillers, but we needed, we needed to reduce uh, the surveillance by much. So one of the things that we did is we relocated the bigger chiller, which is a 2,000 ton chillers, out of the central plant so it doesn't count as the central plant equipment uh, in order to reduce the total amount of uh, chillers. So we actually had to, uh, to build a mechanical room because it is located in the cooling tower area. And it's actually like one inch uh, from the distance, the minimal distance. Otherwise, it would be counted as uh, the central plant equipment. So it was really, really tight. But uh, that's what we needed to be able to reduce the surveillance to one hour, uh, one hour a day. And uh, just to add uh, to that, uh, we uh, we installed a dual compressor chiller. So it's two times uh, thousand tons to increase the redundancy as well as the efficiency and turn down uh, ratio for. Uh, for operational uh, purpose. Right, so uh, let's now make our way to the cooling towers and, and along with the chillers, the, the, the towers and the, the heat pumps. Um, so these were all big equipment and really important equipment to, to select and, and, and procure as part of the project. So, so Simon, even though your firm was uh, responsible for, um, uh, for delivering those equipment, can you tell us a little bit more about the selection process and, uh, and how Dominic's team was involved and, and, and was the process, uh, did you involve him in, and collaborate with him on, the, on, on the, the selection process for these big equipment? Yeah, all of the big equipments have been selected with Dominic's team because uh, we're not in a kind of project where, where uh, the decision is only driven by cost. We need to take into account a lot of other things like efficiency, ease of maintenance, uh, life expectancy, uh, and maintenance, and a lot of other stuff if we want the project to be uh, efficient uh, on a long-term uh, period. So uh, we, we took a lot of time with his team to look at all these things and make sure we, we, just, we choose the right equipment for the long-term operation. Right, and, and uh, as we see the the demolition and construction of the, the cooling towers, Dominic, uh, can you say that in the end you got the equipment that you that you wanted and that you needed? Uh, yeah, sure. We were involved uh, in the uh, in the, the decision. So uh, uh, me and my team uh, also uh, were uh, really happy uh, uh, for uh, the chiller that were selected and uh, also the cooling tower were uh, the work uh, were really well. So uh, we're happy with the the, the process. Great, and, um, and so the cooling towers were really reduced a lot in size, or at least the, the water uh, they contained was an was, uh, interesting fact, was reduced by more than 90%. And, and we all know that mechanical rooms, they take valuable space inside of buildings. Um, so sometimes with this type of deep retrofit, like in this case, we were able to, uh, to, uh, to free some space, eliminate some equipment, and. And, um, and that opens an opportunity to, to monetize that, that real asset, that important uh, space. So uh, Dominic, what, uh, that, I think, tell us what we're looking at right now, what that used to be and, and, uh, and what you do with that free space now. Yeah, right now, it's, uh, what we see is uh, the, the, uh, where the, the old uh, cooling tower uh, were standing. And so uh, there, there was a, a reservoir uh, that was a water tank of the, the, the cooling tower. Actually, there was uh, more water there than uh, than we have in the Olympic pool. So uh, <laughs> it was uh, really hard to, to maintain, especially for the chemical part and the bacteria part. Uh, we need to add uh, uh, about uh, 2,000 uh, liter uh, um, of uh, uh, chlorine uh, yep. every week, so. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, yeah. and so you're in the business of making events, uh, right? Um, yeah, we, we're going to see on, uh, on some picture, uh, yeah, our, our core business is to make some event. And uh, we are really uh, creative. Uh, we have a team that uh, when they, they saw something, uh, they, they see something, they, they want to do something with it. So uh, what we did is uh, to organize uh, their uh, a fashion show uh, in the the, uh, the the place where the the, the tower were, was standing, right. So your marketing team was, uh, was yeah, pretty. They're, they're really here. good. <laughs> yeah, they're really good. So let's now enter the main boiler room. Uh, we saw Simon that the steam had been uh, previously removed from the entire rest of the facility, and uh, and now it needed to be addressed in the in the main boiler room. So um, there was a pretty innovative solution that was selected here. Can you tell us uh, more about it? Yeah, most of the time when we do a steam to hot water conversion, when it comes to the boilers, the, uh, the regular solution is to replace them with new ones, with new hot water boilers. But in this case, uh, in order to reduce the cost of the, of the project, we wanted to reuse them because we have to understand that at the Olympic Stadium, uh, the size of the boiler has to be like really, really big because when there's a major event in, uh, in the, the playfield area, we need a lot of capacity, but unfortunately, they don't operate a lot of hours a day at high capacity, so there's not a lot of savings related to it. So we wanted, in order to reduce the cost, we wanted to reuse them. So prior to that, we just made some tests just to make sure they were in, uh, in good conditions. So we, we looked at the tube thickness and stuff like that just to make sure they would last uh, at least for 20, 25 years. And since they were really good quality boilers, like pretty much way better than what we can find in uh, new commercial boilers right now, uh, we decided to reuse them and just make uh, a, uh, just uh, update them so we can, you know, make water with it instead of steam. Uh, we also updated the controls on it. So we, we put, we installed new controls all over it with the VFDs. Uh, we also converted the, uh, the pressurized vessel. Uh, we made some modifications just to make sure uh, it could produce water and not steam anymore uh, without any failure. We added a uh, flue gas heat recovery to increase efficiency as well. And uh, we, also reduces, uh, we also reduced the capacity of the burner just by around 20% because uh, th that's in uh, the, the global strategy of reducing the uh, operational cost. So it helped reducing the surveillance of the uh, stationary engine in the, in the uh, boiler plant. Right, well, so, so certainly, Simon, converting those boilers was uh, a little bit more risky and required more engineering time than uh, simply purchasing new boilers. Uh, so that was a interesting solution to save costs, but also on the, uh, the longevity of the, of the, the equipment. Uh, Dominic, uh, how did your team uh, um, perceive that measure and, and are you happy to, to, keep have those, uh, to still have those boilers in your boiler room? Uh, is your staff happy to, uh, yeah. with the, the, the final product delivered? In fact, uh, it was kind of emotional. You know, uh, my staff uh, loved these uh, boilers and they were really attached to it. But uh, uh, these barter are, are uh, still really good. Uh, uh, Simon and his team uh, did some uh, thickness test, but uh, we did it also. And uh, we, we made together the decision that to keep them because uh, right. the, the equipment were good and uh, have a good uh, 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 life uh, in front of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, of course. So that was a joint decision for sure. And Dominic, can you touch quickly on the impact on the, the maintenance we, uh, um, and, and the, the de, uh, derating of the boilers from, from steam to hot water? Uh, what is the, the real impact on, your, uh, on the operators needed in the boiler room now, before and after? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, uh, before that, it was a 24-hour a day of uh, surveillance. So uh, we need to add uh, many people on a 12-hour shift, uh, even during uh, Saturday night. Uh, so uh, we had uh, six people in our team at that time. And now uh, we have only uh, three people uh, working on a normal day shift. Uh, 
So uh, it's uh, really easier uh, for us to, to attract these people uh, that are really hard to, to, uh, to hire. And uh, we used to keep them now uh, in our team. And now they can do other things elsewhere on the site, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. Also, uh, they're, not, they're not obliged to stay in the boiler room. Now we, they, they can do some maintenance uh, other where uh, in the stadium. Yeah, so that's interesting how many benefits can, can come out of these measures. Uh, we don't see them all at the beginning uh, all the time. So um, there's one last episode, one last event I'd like to touch on uh, for you, Simon, that shows, I think, the, uh, the accountability and commitment of your team to deliver a, a system that works uh, no matter what. So take us back to uh, New Year's Eve 2017, please. Uh, it was at the end of the project. The new hot water system was installed but not fully uh, optimized yet um, so what happened so we just finished the startup of the the steam to hot water conversion we were about to leave for a uh, christmas vacation and we knew something might happen because you know when we when you start a new system you know that something's going to go wrong and most of the time it's uh, it's always during night or you know with uh, some or Christmas Day or something like that. So we, we decided to set up uh, some kind of email alert so we, can, we could receive all the, uh, the alert from the BMS to our cell phone. But, you know, since we don't really take our mail uh, during night, we also decided to send this email to an automatic voicemail that, we, that would call us and just read the email alert. So uh, what, what happened is on the uh, New Year's Eve, there was a rave party at the Olympic Stadium, one of, one of the many events that they, that they hold. And uh, one of our guys received a call in the middle of the night. And uh, you know, when, he, when he just hear what, uh, what was the alert, he knew that it was pretty bad. So he took his car, went to the Olympic Stadium at like 1 a.m., 2 a.m. in the morning, tried to find what was wrong with the operators over there, and uh, they, they, they found out that, w that it was a, uh, a coil that freezed, so there was a, and it burst, it bursted, so uh, there was a major leak, so we experienced like a major pressure drop in the network, so they, they, uh, they succeed to just, you know, close the valves and stuff like that, and they were able to reopen the system, and again, it was seamless for uh, the party, they didn't see anything, uh, they, they, uh, they react really quickly, but it could have been way worse if he, he have never showed up because, you know, operators over there, they didn't really know the new system yet. Uh, training has not been completed. There was a lot of stuff that, needs to, that needed to be, to be done. So uh, they really appreciated that we, uh, we were there to help them. So it, it really showed the, the kind of commitment that we have in our, in, in our kind of project. And Dominic, uh, did you keep some of those tools for, uh, for up until today? Yeah, sure. Uh, what was impossible before with the, the pneumatic or old control system uh, now are, are possible. And uh, so with the, the building management system uh, that being updated and the tools that the ecosystem put in place, uh, now uh, we can operate from a distance and uh, receive some call uh, directly on our cell phone if there's a problem. So uh, now it's not the ecosystem that are, are called if there's a problem but it's my team and the alarm are linked uh, directly to their cell phone. Right. So as, uh, as participants uh, write down their questions and uh, uh, at the bottom of your screen, uh, let's make a, maybe a summary of the project, Dominic. Uh, so the project has been running for, uh, for, uh, for a little bit of time now. Can you, uh, can you walk us through some of the main results and, and how uh, did it perform so far? Let's start with the energy savings. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, uh, at the beginning of the project, uh, what was uh, promised by uh, Ecosystem was about uh, 1.2 million. Now we are at uh, 1.6 million of saving. Uh, we're still working on it, but uh, we, uh, uh, we're really happy to, uh, with the, these results. So it's about a third uh, of our uh, build that we had before. And that excludes also the indirect uh, operational and maintenance savings that you're able to, uh, to do now that uh, you have some staff that was freed from uh, uh, lighting maintenance and, and boiler and, and chiller rooms? 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, like we said, the two electricians that were re replacing two uh, that uh, work now uh, on uh, uh, other uh, maintenance and uh, the three people, uh, uh, the three stationary uh, uh, engineer uh, that there are now uh, working uh, in other departments. So uh, that's a good saving for us. Yep. Uh, what about greenhouse gas emissions savings now? What would you have to? How would you say results were met? Yeah. Well, uh, in the at the beginning of the project, it was about uh, fifty percent that were uh, supposed to to be reduced. Now we're more about uh, uh, sixty-six percent of a reduction, uh, and uh, we're gonna probably at uh, seventy soon. Great. And, and now touching on, uh, on financial incentives. So there were a number of subsidies available for this project. Some of them were guaranteed from the start. Uh, how much was it? A little bit more than $3 million, Dominic? Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly, uh, but it was between uh, three and four million of uh, subsidies. So uh, that's one thing that is really interesting by regrouping all the, the, the measure together. It's uh, really easier to uh, to, to get these uh, these phone and uh, project cost. So uh, initially, the project was uh, was uh, defined in the contract as twenty two point seven million dollars. How did it uh, cost you in the end? Well, it got ex it cost exactly uh, twenty two point seven uh, million. Uh, it was in the contract guarantee cost, so uh, there was no extra cost uh, in the project. Great, and, and the schedule, uh, I think it was, uh, there was also a, a clause for a project schedule under uh, 36 months? Yeah, it was. Uh, th there were uh, some penalties uh, if uh, it lasts longer than uh, 36 months, uh, but we completed it in uh, 33 months. So uh, it was very fast for all the work that have been done. So uh, congrats, Dominic. Uh, I think you also received a, a few awards. You, I mean, you, you and your team and the, the entire project team. Uh, what were these awards? Yeah, we received, uh, in collaboration with Ecosystem, uh, uh, the prize uh, at the uh, AEE Association of uh, Energy Engineers in uh, 2018. Uh, we also received a first prize uh, from the ASHRAE in uh, 2019. So uh, special thanks to Ecosystem and also to my team. Uh, everyone worked uh, really hard to, uh, to get those uh, awards. Great. Uh, and, and finally, uh, to you, Simon. Uh, so in retrospect, uh, we, we talked about the schedule. Uh, Mr. Landry mentioned, uh, maybe not today, but in the past, that it could have been a project because of the, the, the magnitude, the, all the scope involved, all the measures. could have taken him easily uh, 10 years with the, the previous process, and it was done in less than three. So, so in your opinion, what made this possible? I think when you made that much intrusive work in a live building, you really need to be in control of all the projects. So you need to be involved in the design as well as the construction and the commissioning. So you are able to you know, uh, react really quickly on all unforeseen events. So uh, that helps a lot because otherwise you just need to you know, uh, shut down the whole place or uh, a, a close area to do the work because you're not able to work in a live uh, building. So that's really essential. And uh, I know that in our project, uh, the, the, you know, the construction teams uh, are really involved in the design part and the designers are involved in the construction phase with help uh, mixing the expertise of everyone, which increase the overall expertise of, uh, of, of the project teams. And uh, it also helps uh, helping uh, the, uh, the client to do uh, the, uh, the operation while we are in transition phase between, you know, a turnover, let's say if we are doing a steam to hot water conversion, um, during the work you need to still operate the building, but that's a transition phase, so nobody knows exactly how it's supposed to work. You don't, uh, the staff is not trained, so it helps a lot. Um, if you are involved in both design and construction to help the client in this particular phase. And as well, the last thing that is probably the most important thing is collaboration. Collaboration within our team between designers and, and uh, constructors, but also uh, with the client. Uh, I mean, uh, we are expert in you know, designing 
measures and doing if, uh, energy efficiency and stuff like that. But uh, they know, you know, uh, your building better than we, we do because you, you live there, you operate it every day. So um, this is essential that we have a good collaboration and we definitely add one at the Olympic Stadium. And that's the main reason why uh, th that project is such a success. So thank you, uh, Dominic and Simon. Um, uh, that was very valuable insight. So uh, before we go to the, while you, you write down your last few questions, uh, I think what you, you showed shows, th shows that um, with, uh, it is possible to, to reach multiple goals uh, in a project, whether they're economical, environmental, or, or renewing assets with a holistic approach. And, and also, I think you demonstrated that, with, uh, that innovation plays a big role. Uh, innovation in the, the technical solutions and technologies used, but also innovation in the way the project is delivered and, and tries to make sure that the, the interests of, of both parties are aligned as much as possible. And, and finally, that interest, uh, that alignment of interest driving collaboration that we saw and, uh, and a good uh, rewarding project experience for, for all. So uh, let's move to, um, to questions. Um, so Dominic, uh, um, I don't know if you, if you want to take this one. Do you know how was the public funding for this project set up? Uh, maybe this, uh, you know, this is project, this is a question from, of course, the, the, the Quebec, um, uh, the, the Quebec uh, set up in, in, in uh, maybe different than, uh, than in other provinces or, or states in the US. Uh, do you have, uh, do you have a, an answer to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we receive a, a special fund uh, for, for that project, about uh, 50 million for uh, the, the province uh, government, and the rest was taken on our operation and uh, other uh, budget. Okay. And was it a provincial city or a public authority, the, the Olympic Park? It's a provincial. A lot provincial. of people think it's uh, from the city, but it's a provincial uh, installation. Okay. Um, we have a question. What are the regulations uh, for this type of, uh, of integrated project delivery? Is there any, uh, any regulation that, that allows or, uh, of course, uh, it's a... Uh, I know the, the, the answer. Uh, in the, 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 the Quebec law, uh, there's a tree line about the, these kind of projects. So, uh, uh, three simple line. I don't remember exactly uh, what are these, but uh, uh, it's uh, all the law that we need to respect about the, the, the public uh, uh, bids and call for tender, and uh, it's the same law that we we uh, we, we use uh, on mm -hmm. with all other projects. In fact, yeah, and maybe also it, uh, it touches on the fact that uh, you know design build uh, is allowed in, in, in Quebec and, and in many other places. Uh, another question, does ecosystem have access to uh, uh, different uh, fabricators and trades to reuse equipment and, and build uh, custom equipment quickly? So maybe, uh, Simon, you want to speak to how we select contractors, uh, those that we, we have you know, uh, worked with, and also we, uh, we work with those that the, the client is, is uh, familiar with as well. Uh, yeah, I don't think we, we do it differently than any other contractors or engineers, but you know, uh, what we do is since we commit to results, we, we really want to make sure we, inv like our people are more involved in the solution and we are, we carefully take care of the design of everything, like if it's a new solution, a new product, just to make sure that we deliver what we said to the client. So we just, you know, we, we add another layer of, of um, I would say, of um, uh, um, we, we deeply look into the solution and make sure that it's going to work. And if, if, if it doesn't, we, we work on that and we'll find the solution. And, you know, we guarantee everything. So. Uh, even your, we are your, accountable for, for what we... Your contractor, I remember, your contractors were uh, working with you to add new solution to reduce the cost of the project also. Yep. So that's maybe another Th That was idea another collaboration. Are, are so, uh, you know, if we, if we can find solution to save money, uh, we want to help them saving money as well. And, you know, if everyone is happy, we have a better project. 
Uh, Dominic, uh, another question for you here. What is the impact of, of COVID on your current operations and, and energy consumption? Uh, well, for all the operation, it's uh, it's really bad. Uh, we did not uh, uh, sell uh, a <laughs> dog uh, on the last uh, six months, or uh, so it's it's uh, not good for uh, the operation. For the ener energy, also, it's pretty bad because, uh, uh, as we said, there there's a lot of people that are working there, uh, and uh, we need to uh, add more uh, fresh air. So probably uh, this year our gas consumption uh, will raise a little bit. Great. And, and Simon, uh, if you had to pick one main difficulty in this project, uh, what would it be? Uh, that's a good one, actually. I would say probably um, <coughs> everything there was unique. Like we, it, like we, we never do that, but. There, it was really specific, no copy-paste, nothing that you have done before in other any site can work over there. You need to do specific things because, you know, they are unique. It's a unique building. It's a huge building. It has so many type of, you know, events that needs you need to accommodate your, your, your things. So uh, it was like quite a challenge to work in these really different condition that we used to uh, work with because normally we work in hospitals, campus, schools. Uh, even though they are all different, they sometimes they have some, they, they look the same sometimes, but there's no, there, there's no other Olympic stadium uh, anywhere. Great, so thank you again to, um, to our panelists, uh, Mr. Dominique Desjardins. Uh, and Mr. Landry from the, the Olympic Park. Uh, thank you to Simon Verville from Ecosystem for your kind participation. Um, thank you to all of you for, uh, for uh, being with us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the formula. We, we tried something new um, and, and we hope you learned some, some valuable insight. It's always, uh, it's always uh, good to stay connected. So if you, um, if you have further questions, uh, feel free to reach out to the Olympic Park or ecosystem to ask uh, uh, those, those questions or, or just uh, continue the conversation. So have a nice day and goodbye. <laughs>